Hi, welcome to the next of our series of mini lectures. This is a continuation of the last lecture where we start to look at combining gain dynamics through differential equations with the photons that are trapped inside the cavity. And of course we have a cavity, it's stable, it creates a Gaussian beam, we can calculate that, it selects frequencies. Uh, we have our three-level energy system that we're talking about with two pumps, although today to make things simple we're going to ignore that pump even though it will appear just in case we want to add it, we just set the value of it to zero. Uh, we have a line shape that operates at one frequency, so one of the longitudinal modes is excited, and so we don't have any frequency dependence here. This frequency nu, of course, comes over and appears here in I sub nu, saying the only light we have is at that, frequ at that frequency. And then we have the Einstein coefficients, which describe the differential equations, as we've talked about quite a bit before about the interaction of the population of the levels with the light and the photons. Um, we made an analogy to a system of tanks in the last lecture where we had a pump that could pump water either from tank 3 to 2 in the downward direction if tank 3 had more water than tank 2 or would pump in reverse from tank 2 to tank 3 if there was more water in tank 2 and the speed of the pump, how fast it pumped water, just depended on the intensity of the light. And this is completely analogous to the situation we have in our laser, um, where we have some pump process independent of light pumping state two. Remember, we're ignoring that pump for the time being. So we're setting these values to zero. And the combination of absorption, taking electrons up, and stimulated emission, uh, which brings electrons back down and creates a photon through this term of our differential equations, which is appearing here. Here we have our photons going down, and if N2 is N1, uh, you can see it takes photons down. Here you notice we have the opposite sign in level 1, and this is absorption. In other words, if N1 is bigger than N2, then it's a, a reduction of the number of electrons in state 1 and a positive adding to state 2. So this is our system of differential equations we'll be describing. And what I did is I took these differential equations and I programmed them into MATLAB to give me the populations as a function of time. If I wanted to know the steady state populations, I would just set these differential equations to zero, and then I've got an algebra problem I have to tediously solve. But personally, I think it less, takes less time to program the thing. Um, so what we discovered last time, and this is, if you'll look at figure 8.5 of your book, this corresponds to case 1A and case 1B. Again, that's figure 8.5 of your book. And um, I'm displaying these on a logarithmic scale uh, so we can get an idea that the population of state 0 effectively doesn't change because it's many, many orders of magnitude greater than the populations of state 2 and state 1. And if we don't have any light, you see if the bottom state empties out very quickly, in other words, the time constant is short, the rate's high, we have a favorable condition for lasing because the population population of state 2 is bigger than state 1. If, on the other hand, we have a relatively long lifetime in state 1, 10 times longer than the rate of decay from state 2 to state 1, then you can see that what happens is we only have the population in state 2 be larger than state 1 for a short amount of time. Um, only when we first start the thing. And this makes a lot of sense if you sort of visualize this with tanks of water. <laughs> it's a very good analogy in this case. Um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you some different graphs I calculated where I include the intensity. And essentially what I'm doing is I'm going to display only states 1 and state 2 on a linear scale, not a logarithmic scale, so we can see more clearly slight differences between the states. Um, and so the graphs are going to look different, but they're really exactly the same thing, and you can actually compare the numbers and see they're analogous. And again, we're getting rid of state zero, because otherwise I wouldn't be able to see it very well on a linear scale. The red line and the green line would just be at zero, for all you could tell, if I'm displaying a line on the order of 10 to the 23rd. Um, and so that's what we're going to be seeing. And the other thing I'm going to do is, instead of going from zero to three microseconds here, I'm going to turn on my light right at the end of this graph. So I'm going to let things come to steady state so they're not changing anymore. And then I'm going to turn on my light right here, and it, you're going to see the horizontal scale extend out to six microseconds and show you twice as much time turning on the light at three microseconds. And this is very, very easy to code. It takes maybe three lines of code to add this feature to a differential equation solver. So let's take a look at the first case where the light inside the cavity, um, I sub nu is fairly dim. 
And so in terms of relative units, and these numbers don't mean anything, um, we have, say, a value of I sub nu, the intensity at some particular frequency of 0.1. You'll notice that, that state 2, which is now shown as the green line, and state 1, which is shown as the blue line, again, pretty much stabilizes in the top case with state 2 um, being higher than state 1 by, it looks like, about a factor of 10. And that certainly makes sense because the time constants are a factor of 10 difference. But at 3 microseconds, right where this graphs in, when I turn on the light, notice that the valve opens. Since 2 is bigger than 1, when I open this light-activated valve, more water leaks out, the states restabilize, and the total population of state 2 goes down. And my population inversion gets less. Now I'm going to turn up my intensity by a factor of 10, relatively speaking, and have 10 times as much intensity. In that case, you can see that when we turn the light on, we see pretty much the same thing, except the valves open more, the decay is much faster, it goes down more quickly, and we further depopulate state 2. Um, and we see a small transient state change in state 1, and it's a little bit higher, but not that much higher. Um, what we're going to see in the third case is now I'm going to up my intensity by a factor of 1,000. And when I up my intensity by a factor of 1,000, you might expect state 2 to drop way the hell down below state 1, but that's not what's going to happen. Notice that what happens is state 2 reaches its maximum and drops down to state 1 and follows it exactly. So the populations of state 2 and state 1 are pretty much identical. Um, why does this make sense? And if you think about it, once we drain state 2 down into state 1, right, if state 2 ever drops below state 1, the high intensity is going to lift the electrons back up from state 1 to state 2. Remember, these differential equations allow bidirectional operation. The electrons go down from 2 to 1 if state 2 is higher than state 1, and up from state 1 to state 2 if state 1 has more population than state 2. So essentially what happens is at very high intensities, these processes balance each other out and make the populations of state 1 and state 2 be exactly the same. And this is called gain saturation. So let's write that down because your book talks about this a lot. And it's important that you know it. And gain saturation just means there's so much light in the cavity. And relatively speaking, the, the valve or pump term from the light is so much greater than the other rates inside the the laser system, that it's going to equalize the population of the two lasing levels, and they're going to be the same. But if our intensity drops back down again, we can again create inversion. And we'll see later on some of the dynamic things that you can do with this to get pulses out of lasers, but that's toward the end of the course.